Hello all, I see a hello coming in from Kuwait. Thank you so much for joining us. I am delighted to introduce Nicole Sampson, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and SUNY Distinguished Professor of Chemistry. Last year, Dr. Sampson led the development for a shared vision for the future of the college and has worked to develop many initiatives to elevate its stature and impact. Through her 28 years as a researcher and educator, Dr. Sampson has mentored numerous students and has championed expanding opportunities for all students through their coursework and research. She is a strong example of Stony Brook's excellence in providing inspiration for our next generation of leaders. Welcome, Dean Sampson. Thank you so much, Janet, and welcome to everyone who's here today for Dr. Matt Lerner's presentation of COVID-19 and support for the autism community. This presentation today continues our series of talks by our amazing colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences. And the need for a better understanding of autism and for evidence-based practice has never been greater. And so I'm very pleased that we're sharing this moment together during these very challenging times. One of the core beliefs in our college is to use our existing knowledge and resources to address important societal problems through both education and research. Earlier this year, we introduced our collaborative navigation to 2030, a guide in which we recognize three constellations of intellectual strength. Our constellation of scholarly creativity and exploration aligns with Professor Lerner's presentation today, as it reflects our investment in solving problems through cross-disciplinary initiatives that look at the relationship between biology and culture with a specific focus on the interaction of brain, mind, and body. I invite you to view more on our webpage and on the Navigation to 2030 at our website, stonybrook.edu slash CAS. First, I have two introductions to make today. And first, I'm pleased to introduce our moder moderator, excuse me, for today's discussion, Debbie Gross, who currently serves as coordinator of the Autism Initiative. In this role, Debbie primarily focuses on creating and coordinating the initiative's recreational programming available through the university. An alumna of the College of Arts and Sciences Department of Theater Arts, Debbie is particularly pleased that her role within the Autism Initiative helps bring together many different departments to work toward common goals for the autism community. So thank you, Debbie, for joining us today. And second, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Lerner, Associate Professor of Psychology, Psychiatry, and Pediatrics, housed in the Department of Psychology, where he directs the Stony Brook Social Competence and Treatment Lab. Dr. Lerner received his PhD from the University of Virginia, and his research focuses on understanding mechanisms of and developing interventions for social and emotional functioning among children and adolescents with autism spectrum disorders and ADHD. He has published more than 90 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and he serves on eight editorial boards of top academic journals related to autism, child development, and clinical psychology. Dr. Lerner has received grants from organizations including the National Institutes of Health, NIH, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, the Simons Foundation, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the recipient of numerous early career awards, including the Biobehavioral Research Award for Innovative New Scientists from the National Institute of Mental Health, the Young Investigator Awards from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and the International Society for Autism Research, the Transformative Contributions Award from the Autism and Developmental Disorders Section of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, and most recently, the 2020 Sarah S. Sparrow Early Career Research Award, and the 2020 David Chakow Early Career Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions to Clinical Psychology, both from the American Psychological Association. Most importantly, Dr. Lerner serves as the research director of the Autism Initiative launched last fall, which he will be discussing with us today. So without much further ado, I now present Matthew Lerner. Thank you for joining us, and we're really looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you so much, Dean Sampson, and uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Janet, for arranging this. Um, first of all, can you hear me? A little thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, there we go. Um, so I want to 
Uh, thank everyone uh, for joining uh, this this talk today. We're very excited to to speak with you all. Um, this is really a, an exciting opportunity uh, to talk about an area, uh, a population that that uh, my team and I care uh, very deeply for, and um, who's you know pretty su substantially affected uh, by all the challenges associated um, with COVID in ways that might be unexpected uh, for some for some here. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, autism and uh, particularly some of the unique challenges and uh, responses uh, to uh, the COVID pandemic uh, that we see in the autism community. And then I want to introduce you to, as you see here, uh, the autism initiative here at Stony Brook. This is something we've been cooking up for some time and we're really excited to share with you in particular to talk to you about ways in which we are trying to uh, respond to those challenges uh, within the community. For those with questions, um, uh, as Dean Sampson mentioned, uh, Debbie Gross is going to be monitoring the chat box and um, will be uh, pulling forward questions uh, to me, which we'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, address at the end. And of course, if you have any questions that go unaddressed, um, you can email us uh, at the initiative email address, which I'll, I'll share with you. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, you know, I'm here really to share this uh, new a university-wide initiative related to autism with, with this uh, goal here of uh, promoting research and clinical excellence and importantly fostering a sense of community inclusion and acceptance for those with ASD and their families and I think it's really important uh, that both of those aspects of the mission are clear here um, you know, there are there are centers uh, related uh, to autism that focus on uh, on strong research and, and clinical work uh, there are organizations that focus on, on, on promoting understanding and uh, broader um, inclusion of those of ASD. But um, it's uh, woefully rare nowadays uh, to be able to see those things knit together well. And I'm really proud of the work of our team in, in focusing on doing that. So what is ASD? Well, this is not a whole lecture on autism. You can uh, enroll in my undergraduate course on autism if you'd like to learn about that. Uh, but, but meanwhile, um, you know, briefly, uh, autism is a, a neurodevelopmental disorder um, present uh, at, uh, at birth uh, or um, where, which affects uh, social and emotional uh, development uh, of, those, uh, of those who are affected. Importantly, um, autism can present in a very wide variety of ways. And uh, this has you know, presented an interesting challenge even uh, in society as we try to think about ways to support those on the spectrum. Uh, we have individuals with ASD who are um, uh, uh, extremely um, bright, extremely verbal, um, are integrated into society and may go much of their lives without necessarily uh, even being aware of the fact that they have autism. Um, there's a, 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 a significant increase in the last decade of, of adults, for instance, who are newly diagnosed, um, all the way to folks with uh, severe and significant uh, developmental uh, delays um, uh, from birth, uh, who perhaps require more support throughout their lifespan. Um, but what's common about autism is uh, the way in which it affects uh, the ability to uh, engage and connect uh, with others uh, socially, uh, as well as the presence of, of kind of an extreme uh, focus or kind of repetitive behaviors in certain areas of focus uh, for those on the spectrum. I think the other unique thing about autism, or particular thing about autism, is you know autism, uh, and this is an important point to say, uh, you know, particularly uh, today, um, uh, does not discriminate. Autism cuts across uh, racial, socioeconomic, demographic, and geographic lines, um, and so importantly, understanding the impact of autism uh, has an impact uh, on all of us, and could and have a, have an impact on anybody. Uh, crucially, well, most people are uh, increasingly aware of the presence of autism, and perhaps you know that many people have uh, individuals with autism in their families, or uh, or autistic identify as autistic themselves. Um, what's perhaps less known or less appreciated is the way in which uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has affected the autism community, and uh, those ways it turns out can be uh, quite profound. Um, Perhaps most notably, uh, individuals with ASD, even though uh, are, are 
have often reduced social contact with others. If the social world is hard, can, uh, then the social world is one in which you're you know, uh, perhaps less engaged. That said, uh, we also know that the vast majority of people with autism do wish for, desire, and appreciate social connection with others, with family members, with friends, but are more isolated. In fact, one of the lines of research uh, that's being pioneered by several groups here at, so at Stony Brook is a focus on understanding what the nature of that isolation is. Well, now here we are where social distancing <laughs> is happening to everybody. And so uh, there have been uh, some, uh, some who have uh, speculated that, oh, perhaps you know, if you're autistic, you know, this will be easier on you. Uh, well, in fact, what we hear from most, not everybody, but most uh, families and individuals we work with is that uh, this social distancing is even harder. That those who already were feeling alone are feeling more alone. And we already know uh, from uh, literally thousands of studies of, of, uh, of, of all people that isolation is one of the uh, most uh, significant, uh, long has some of the most significant long-term effects on health and well-being. And so those with ASD are, are at increased risk of uh, a whole host of challenges simply associated with having reduced contact. People with autism also often rely on schedules um, and rely on structure. When the, if the social world, such as it is, is uh, kind of overwhelming, uh, often being able to compensate by having clear expectations and structure, visual schedules, um, clear routines, is the way in which uh, individuals with ASD can best uh, learn. In fact, most of the evidence-based approaches uh, for treating, supporting, and educating those with autism rely on structure and routine. Well, as we all know, our structure and routine has been thrown out the window for the last uh, three plus months. And this is, of course, also true for those on the spectrum. And uh, this, this is therefore even more disruptive for those on the spectrum who really rely on those, on those supports to be able to, uh, to function effectively and to learn effectively. Likewise, uh, COVID-19 has also impacted other supports that those with ASD often rely on. Um, uh, people, uh, uh, children with autism are um, entitled under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, to educational supports uh, that range, uh, that are really quite broad in terms of what, what they can offer. It can be uh, everything as simple as, as supports within the classroom, to having an individual aid, having occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, behavior therapy, um, uh, a counselor. These are supports that, that thankfully we as a society have, uh, uh, have endorsed as, as, as uh, both important, available, helpful, and, uh, and, and ones to which those on the spectrum are entitled. Well, many families who we work with uh, tell us that you know, the losing of those supports has really, has really become even more of a challenge. And you know, well, well, many uh, of us who are parents uh, are struggling, of course, to all of a sudden become parents and homeschoolers, uh, parents of those with ASD, um, are having are often struggling even more because they have to not only learn how to uh, navigate Google Classroom, but also to do so uh, while providing the expert uh, supports that their children often uh, receive and are entitled to. Uh, and in many cases, uh, many families we've spoken to, you know, those supports are, are not able to be provided uh, effectively remotely. Uh, similar uh, for behavior supports. Um, Many individuals with ASD uh, uh, um, receive uh, behavioral training and support for things like uh, learning language. Others struggle with issue, things like self-regulation or emotion regulation um, and to regulate their own frustration. Uh, behavior supports uh, often provide uh, a tool to help uh, to learn how to do that effectively. And uh, unfortunately, in the absence of, uh, and, and certainly among uh, more significantly affected uh, individuals on the spectrum, perhaps who can't communicate verbally their needs and frustrations. Uh, sometimes they need, you know, fairly intensive uh, behavior support at school, even for their own safety. Well, those folks are also at home now, and so COVID-19 has has uh, created uh, something of a crisis within that particular community, where you know parents, uh, understandably, really aren't necessarily trained to provide the intensive up to 40 hours a week of of one-on-one uh, -on -one behavior support that those individuals uh, need. And crucially, uh, emotional supports. Um, 
as I said, uh, counseling, uh, uh, psychotherapy, and other kind of self-regulatory and motion regulation strategies uh, are vital for those with ASD. And this is not just, uh, just children. This is uh, folks across the lifespan. Uh, mental health uh, uh, comorbidities are uh, co-occurring factors like uh, anxiety, depression, ADHD are extremely common. Uh, sadly, one of the um, most important uh, discoveries in the autism research world of the last five years is the extremely high rates of suicidality uh, that we see uh, among young adults on the spectrum. And that's something that those of us in the mental health field are, are uh, really scrambling to do our best to come up with, with better, more effective remote supports for. Well, uh, in absence of availability of, of, um, of an in-person therapist, uh, many folks are also likewise scrambling to come up with uh, their own su uh, support system or remote support system or, or, or to take care of, to take advantage of telehealth uh, to deal with those, those concerns. Uh, importantly, um, you know, in, uh, we know from the literature that uh, families of those uh, with ASD experience elevated rates of family stress. In fact, some literature suggests that uh, it's among the highest rates uh, of those families with those developmental uh, disabilities. This is for a whole host of reasons, um, you know, many of which stem from the need to manage, again, the whole host of a uh, range of supports that are required, as, as well as those con concerns that their children uh, are facing in light of the social and communicative challenges. Well, that family stress is, of course, augmented for everybody right now. But there are also some really specific uh, uh, concerns that we've heard from families uh, who we work with here. Um, for instance, um, if a family member gets sick, who's going to help my child? And you know, out here on, on Long Island, and you know, many of the folks in our research community uh, come from, uh, the, uh, from New York City, from, from Queens, and they've had many family members uh, get sick. And you know, that's one of the things, things we're hearing kind of desperately is how can we provide, uh, how can we provide support and assurance that, uh, that that individual who does often need help from family uh, or others um, will be cared for. Uh, if an individual with ASD uh, uh, themselves gets sick uh, as well, of course, there are important other needs. Um, for those who have, um, uh, communication challenges, again, this isn't everybody, about 30% of the population, but for those who have significant communication challenges, being able to communicate the symptoms of feeling ill um, are, uh, can be difficult. Um, we've unfortunately seen uh, in New York State uh, extraordinarily high rates uh, of, of uh, COVID um, uh, kind of rampaging through residences of uh, folks with ASD uh, who are living together. Um, under uh, state supported housing or, or other agencies, in part because of the communication piece. Uh, also, uh, in part because um, it's very difficult um, to maintain uh, you know, sanitation and hygiene guidelines, and especially you know, if, if somebody, whether somebody has difficulty with communication or rules or structures, or simply you know, challenges with self regulation and impulsivity. You know, the, the kind of fastidious, careful guidelines that all of us now need to follow to be able to safely, you know, wear a mask, uh, get around in the world, wash hands, uh, not to mention the sensory challenges that uh, many individuals often face associated with lots of hand washing or, you know, putting an uncomfortable mask on your face, make adhering to those guidelines even more difficult. Um, so what we see is essentially those with autism um, at, at, at a extraordinarily, uh, in, elevated risk uh, for uh, some of the, the concerns both associated with uh, COVID itself, as well as associated with um, some of the isolation and, uh, uh, the, and, that, and the lockdowns that have been understandably associated with trying to manage a pandemic. The other piece, uh, another piece that we need is, uh, uh, that's worth noting, is that when individuals get sick, get sick um, how are their healthcare providers trained to provide support? The good news is that we do know many ways with ASD, often uh, many ways, often simple ways that uh, folks in the medical profession can uh, better and best support uh, those with autism. Uh, the bad news is that those techniques are not widespread, uh, really almost anywhere. Um, and so it's important then to provide those supports so that if somebody with autism comes in, that they can get the, and access the best care for themselves. 
beyond these challenges, I do think it's also worth taking a moment to note uh, that uh, the, the um, COVID pandemic has also pre pre presented sort of unique and interesting uh, research opportunities uh, that folks are, are, are we're interested in and thinking about and starting to explore uh, related to perhaps some uh, benefits or insights that we can get from folks with autism. Um, as was uh, discussed in a, a recent um, Times Village uh, Herald um, article describing some of the things we're doing, uh, we do have some uh, kids with autism, for instance, teens who have told us recently things like, I was social distancing before it was cool, or uh, young adults who are telling us that actually uh, remote work is has been working better for them than uh, others, perhaps because of the reduced uh, social demands. These are important uh, factors to understand uh, as well. Um, uh, and also to say that, you know, I'm not, I'm not simply here to say that it's all, it's all doom and gloom. I think the other, another piece that's sort of worth uh, thinking about that we're, we're beginning to, to sort of explore and understand is perhaps how the challenges that we are all now experiencing can give us more insight into the experience of those with autism. That is to say, we all wish that we could be more connected uh, to those around us, but we can't right now. Well, imagine feeling that way for a lot of your life. Well, perhaps now this can give us more empathy for the experience of autistic individuals who are perhaps trying to find their inroads for connection. Likewise, uh, there's a phenomenon of Zoom fatigue. Here we are all Zooming, all 124 of us right now. And I guarantee you, not all of you are paying good attention to me. And I guarantee you, not all of you are enjoying staring at my face and then looking at the little screen of your own face and trying to figure out, is it synced up? In fact, the technical difficulties we had at the beginning of this call uh, are perhaps a metaphor for the challenges that those with autism experience every day in trying to process a world that's not quite in sync for them. Well, if that's the case, perhaps, again, we can, we can both subjectively come to better understand what those challenges look like uh, and how they feel for those with autism, but also for those of us uh, who are scientists, uh, this is quite a novel, uh, a novel question. And one of the things we're, we're interested in is perhaps the way in which our brains are processing Zoom and getting exhausted by Zoom might give us an inkling for the ways in which we are perhaps in the right conditions, not all that different uh, from our autistic friends and colleagues. And so with that, I want to talk to you about some of the ways in which we're trying to uh, think about uh, and address uh, the various uh, challenges, needs, supports of those with autism and support the community here. Uh, and this is through the Autism Initiative at Stony Brook. Uh, the website's listed there. We also have a Facebook page, an Instagram, YouTube, so, or, or, or my guess is you can probably Google. So uh, what are we here for? So the Autism Initiative um, is an idea several years in the making. Um, by both myself and a number of colleagues here at Stony Brook to try to think about how we can better support the community uh, and do a better job of working together. And our goals um, are somewhat straightforward. Our goals are to promote the e uh, excellence in research and clinical work through cutting edge integrative projects and services. Integrative meaning really integrating together. We have some amazing experts at Stony Brook. Stony Brook is a world-class uh, research institution and a world-class hospital. And um, we are uniquely situated then uh, to be able to, to capitalize on what each other has to offer. But we're also so big that sometimes we're not always uh, as aware as we could be of all of our mutual interests. Well, our goal here then uh, with, uh, with the initiative is to pull those groups together. Likewise, our goal then is to really unify those autism-related efforts across campus to make sure that the left hand not only knows what the right hand is doing, but is joined together, um, even if literally right now we're probably not all holding hands. Uh, and also to foster, again, this sense of community inclusion and acceptance for individuals with ASD and their families uh, uh, across Long Island and across the region to create, to make Stony Brook a place that, that uh, those with autism and their families want to come. Our vision is that uh, children uh, across Long Island uh, will make, wake up on a Saturday morning and uh, turn to their parent and say, hey, what's happening for me at Stony Brook today? Maybe it's a, 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 a musical program. Maybe it's a research study. Maybe it's a, a, a clinical support with a therapist who they care about. Um, but we want, we want them to wake up and ask that question. And hopefully we'll have some answers. So many of you uh, might recall uh, the Cody Center. The Cody Center is a, um, 
uh, autism center that existed here at Stony Brook uh, from, from the mid-90s for almost 20 years and was really a, 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 a uh, a leader, regional leader uh, in clinical support for autism. I am not originally from Long Island, uh, but even in my training as an autism person, I knew about Stony Brook and I knew about the Cody Center training in Boston and in Virginia and in Chicago. Um, it was really, you know, renowned. Um, so what's happened in recent years with the initiative is essentially we were sort of going beyond, I, I dare say, uh, maybe even far beyond, I don't know. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what the scope of the mission of the Cody Center is um, in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to, to really pull together um, across many different disciplines, across units, across the university, um, a, shared, a shared vision uh, that um, really cuts from uh, basic research through clinical care, through advocacy and support. And the scope uh, is through much of the lifespan. We have uh, individuals here, for instance, who focus on identifying researchers who have done cutting edge work on identifying prenatal factors for race autism. Uh, clinicians uh, with a, a dedicated focus uh, on early childhood and early childhood support. Um, we have uh, individuals like my group uh, that focus on what we call clinical phenotyping or understanding kind of all of the different, the, the kind of rich rainbow of ways that those with autism, that autism can present in different people. Uh, we have those uh, who do interventions. Um, uh, I, am, I am not an MD. I do not do pharmacological interventions, but we do provide uh, different kinds of social interventions, uh, uh, treatments, sometimes free treatments as part of research studies uh, for those um, who are either struggling socially or emotionally. Likewise, we have colleagues, for instance, in neurology who are doing uh, pharmaceutical trials to aid in things like sleep for, for individuals with autism. We're also very interested in the high rates of comorbidity that folks with, uh, folks with autism experience. Comorbidity means co-occurring conditions. So somebody might have autism and sleep problems, they said, or autism and epilepsy, or autism and anxiety, autism and depression, autism and OCD. In fact, it turns out that uh, autism uh, is a disorder that very rarely travels alone. Um, and so uh, it turns out understanding comorbidity is core to understanding the way most people with autism experience autism. And we have uh, some, wor some of the world leaders, actually, some of the very first folks who who've studied comorbidities in autism right here at Stony Brook. We're interested in transitions. Transitions, uh, folks who say transition uh, to adulthood, transition uh, uh, out of school, transition uh, to, to the workplace, uh, and beyond. Uh, we're interested in, in understanding and providing support uh, for college students with autism and also create, creating an environment that uh, autistic individuals feel uh, welcome at, at home. Uh, as well as looking at employment uh, and, and adulthood. Uh, we have, uh, we have, have folks here um, who are, again, some of the world leaders in understanding and quantifying what is successful employment for those with autism. What is it uh, for adults with autism? What does that look like? And how do we secure and ensure that? And most, and perhaps, perhaps most importantly, in, across all of this, you know, we're interested in doing this in the context of supporting diverse communities. And I think uh, especially today, given all that's going on in the world, I want to highlight how important that is. As I said at the beginning, autism cuts across uh, uh, everybody. Uh, there, there is no, uh, uh, across all socio-demographic factors. Um, and so uh, we work very hard and have a number of initiatives to reach out uh, to, to diverse communities, uh, underserved communities, Spanish-speaking communities throughout Long Island to make sure that the, the services and the research that we're doing is meaningful to them. And I'm very proud of the team that we have here. So I want to introduce you to some of the team. Um, so I'm, uh, as I said, I'm Matt Lerner, uh, and I'm the research director of the initiative. We also um, have Jennifer Kalusker, who's a clinical psychologist in our autism clinic, who's the head of autism clinical education here. Uh, and she uh, works to um, infuse training in autism throughout various different programs, be they graduate programs, fellowship programs, residency programs, as well as departments here at, at Stony Brook to increase the quality of care and training and knowledge about autism throughout the university and throughout the hospital. Uh, we've recently hired uh, an amazing clinical care coordinator named uh, Caitlin Emock, Kate Emock. Uh, she is a, a social worker uh, with deep dedication and experience and focus uh, on, this, on this population who uh, works uh, to support uh, those with autism who come in for either clinical services or for research studies um, to try to help them uh, navigate the, the 
complex maze of services and supports they need. And uh, Debbie Gross, who you were introduced to earlier, who's uh, kindly responding to many of your chats in the chat window. She's really our, uh, our, our backbone and our connective tissue. She's the one who makes all of this run, as well as providing, uh, in addition to, to corralling all of us, uh, she provides uh, services and programs for the community on a regular basis, which I'll talk about in a moment. We also have a, a wonderful research team, uh, a wonderful additional uh, senior investigator team, including um, uh, Ken Gato in psychiatry, who's the director of our brain imaging program, uh, Pat Whitaker in psychology, who uh, is, uh, uh, focuses on, and is for decades focused on uh, early exposure, uh, Judy Kroll, who is um, the director of our autism clinic, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Novoa, uh, Maria Vicky Novoa, uh, who's a developmental pediatrician and head of developmental pediatrics uh, here. And of course, the list goes on. I won't, if I named everybody, that's I would take uh, all the rest of our time talking about our team, but we have a wonderful clinical team uh, in psychiatry, including uh, psych psychologists like Deborah Riker and Melissa Palatucci, psychiatrists like Ben DeLucia, ben DeLucia and Lauren uh, Spring, um, and uh, as well as uh, Michael, Michael Greenberg, who's been here uh, for decades and amazing resource. And Will Parkinson is the head of outpatient child psych uh, psychiatry uh, division. Um, and uh, we have an amazing research team. I won't name everybody, but uh, this, they cut across uh, psychiatry, neurology, um, cell biology, social work, uh, economics, linguistics, electrical engineering, computer science. All of these folks are coming together to, to focus on ways in which we can better uh, support and improve and understand uh, those with ASD and to uh, improve the quality of life for this population. And so, as I said, we offer the, the this group then works through array, an array of uh, clinical services, um, many of them housed in the Division of Child and Adolescent uh, uh, Psychiatry, where we have an autism clinic. Um, community outreach services coordinated by Debbie Gross, uh, where we offer, uh, well, before COVID, uh, we offered uh, in-person programming like open mic nights, um, video game nights, book clubs, um, uh, autism clinical education uh, and training um, being head, uh, run by Dr. Kluzker, uh, including work that she's been doing with uh, our pediatric emergency department to uh, provide um, uh, cutting edge uh, modules and care and support to, to, be, to improve the experience of those with ASD who come in to the ED. She's now working with other departments as well. Um, we're also providing ASD information resources uh, and education uh, for the community, things like uh, um, uh, workshops and training for things like self-regulation for kids or ways to, uh, to support uh, structure and learning, uh, as well as, a, as I mentioned before, a whole array of research uh, efforts, which I would just say uh, in my own lab, Social Competence and Treatment Lab, we, are, we have several uh, studies that are going on uh, right now uh, remotely, even, even in view of, of COVID, uh, all of which are designed to do things like um, provide uh, treatment uh, for those with ASD uh, remotely, uh, assessment, uh, care and education, and to understand their experiences. So what are we doing? What are some things we're doing uh, in response to COVID-19, in response to those unique challenges I mentioned to you before? Well, uh, one thing is uh, we're providing uh, various different trainings to support schedules uh, and routines. Um, our wonderful team is uh, offering uh, uh, videos, webinars, uh, Zoom meetings like this uh, on to create visuals um, uh, and have things like how to create visuals, how to maintain routine, how to find structure in a day that feels so unstructured for all of us right now. Um, we're also focusing on ways to, to reduce family stress and, and ways to find support for uh, for individuals to find support for themselves. Um, again, Dr. Kluster and, and Katie Mott have been uh, offering uh, video webinars like this. Um, re related, we're doing this through other ways as well. Uh, Debbie uh, has put together uh, an amazing mentoring program, for instance, called Sidekick, where we have uh, some of our undergraduates here at Stony Brook uh, act as mentors, sidekicks, to uh, teens with ASD in the community. Uh, and they're even able to do this remotely or via Zoom. And, the point is not to provide therapy or anything like that. It's just to have uh, have somebody when you're feeling, you know, alone to reach out to and chat with and get some support and guidance on navigating all of the challenges of, of the world. Um, we, again, as I mentioned, are so continuing to support ASD-specific training for the Pediatric Emergency Department even during COVID, and uh, that has con continued even now. 
And uh, we're very proud that we also um, uh, have uh, one of the, as far as I know, one of the first in the world uh, new studies, uh, it's going to be called Pixie, uh, which is going to be focusing on understanding the impact of COVID-19 and social isolation. We're very proud uh, or, or honored uh, to have received uh, funding from uh, the Office of the Vice President for Research and the Institute for Engineering Driven Medicine here at Stony Brook to uh, track a group of families uh, for six months um, to understand the, the experience of uh, uh, social isolation during COVID-19 um, on that group of families. And importantly, uh, we're focusing a lot on providing information to the public. Uh, we have, in addition to this, um, on our, our Facebook page and on our website, uh, weekly, often actually multiple days per week, uh, either programming, webinars, uh, tools, tips and tricks, uh, essentially trying to provide customized resources. And importantly, we're trying to do so in a way uh, that is responsive to the needs of the community. That is, I've just laid out a whole way, a set of ways in which uh, folks with ASD um, are experiencing challenges, their families may be experiencing challenges or at risk for those challenges. But ultimately, uh, everyone's experience is personal and individual. And our, our hope by creating uh, uh, an initiative and a, a, a sort of inroad for the community to access the expertise that's at Stony Brook, we're gonna continue to work to customize what we're doing to respond to the questions and concerns that have come up and continue to come up. So some new things we're hoping to do in the future. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to develop additional schedules and, and related resources, many of which are, are posted online, as I'll show you in a minute, we're, we're gonna develop more. Uh, we wanna broaden our offering of, of trainings and webinars, um, uh, as well as uh, develop um, an ASD family emergency toolkit. Um, such a thing, uh, as far as I know, doesn't um, exist yet, but it's in uh, anywhere, but it's in, in process here to try to find, say, okay, whether it's co one, thing, one thing that COVID-19 has taught us is that things can happen very suddenly for anybody. And so can we find a way to you know, put together a set of, of resources or tools or a sort of virtual go bag um, that can help families know what to do in those uh, challenging situations? Um, we're trying, we're creating more digital and remote tools uh, for uh, emergency workers and others, um, as well as a sensory red flag kit uh, and sensory friendly PPE uh, for those with ASD. As I mentioned, you know, uh, we all, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know anybody who's like, thinks that putting on a mask and gloves and kind of, you know, bundling up to be able to go to the grocery store is their most fun thing. But if you have significant sensory issues, it might be prohibitively hard to do that. Uh, so we're gonna, we, our goal is to develop res not only resources, but also uh, work to, to try to develop more sensory friendly PPE for the community. Um, and our, we're also hoping to, to further build our clinical core care uh, coordination uh, team. Uh, we have uh, recently, uh, our, our clinical arm has recently hired uh, two new clinicians, uh, psychologists, uh, as well as and we hope to, to hire new staff as well to kind of continue to build this effort. And beyond this, you know, our, our, our goal here is you know, we want to expand our, the clinical services that are available to better meet the community. Well, we have an amazing team here. We're still relatively small relative to what, uh, what the need is. Uh, and there's a, the, the, the need is, is really quite, quite great out here, um, particularly with Stony Brook being kind of the premier academic medical center on Long Island. Understandably, people want to, want to come to us and we, are, we want to make sure that we're able to provide, and meet the, provide for and meet the needs of, of everybody who we can. Uh, we want to continue to increase awareness and acceptance uh, of autism across Long Island. I understand that this is an uh, experience of those with ASD uh, are in some ways unique, but also in some ways, as I've said before, not that different than many of the challenges that others experience as well, just, just more so. Uh, and if we, can, if we can do that, hopefully we can also uh, create a more inclusive and supportive community. Our goal is to continue to increase collaboration among those at Stony Brook. Um, as well as to hopefully create uh, a resource center to deepen the resources available to the ASD community. We have a, a, an amazing network of uh, colleagues and collaborators, uh, agencies uh, across Long Island, um, such as Specialized Autism Support and Information, Family Autism Network, and uh, Asperger and Autism uh, Network, uh, all, of, uh, all of whom we work really closely with, uh, Autism Speaks as well. Um, you know, uh, our goal, hopefully, is to perhaps be a hub and pool, a pool our resources as a way to, uh, to better meet the needs of all families out here. Uh, we're working on developing a speaker series of, of experts at Stony Brook and elsewhere so that we can continue to share 
uh, knowledge with you. I've only given you a little taste, a really small taste of the science uh, and clinical work going on here. Um, uh, so our goal is to, to, to go deeper and share more of that, uh, as well as to provide support uh, for, for more uh, ASD uh, studies here at Stony Brook, um, uh, and to kind of, again, deepen the collaboration if possible. I also promised you at the beginning resources, and I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, our team has been developing some excellent resources here. And importantly, uh, there's no need to frantically write this down. I'm sure we can uh, write Janet, share uh, some of these links, good, uh, after the after this talk as well. But we have our, our initiative website as well as our Facebook page. The Facebook page is being updated dynamically, uh, as well as a, a set of COVID uh, re responsive resources uh, for the ASC community, including, again, some of the visuals, the webinars, uh, various different tools, as well as um, information on, on various uh, uh, mental health and, and behavioral health and support uh, systems uh, that families can access. Um, our team uh, has also put together, and I promise you should not write this down, we will send you the link, uh, but we've created a, uh, a, a shared Google Drive of, of, of the essentially curated best, some of the best shared resources that we've found, um, uh, some of which we've created, some of which we found uh, from our colleagues, everyone's in this together right now. Um, and it includes things like, you know, activities uh, that you can sort of take with you. Uh, uh, social stories uh, to help kind of you know, teach individuals with, uh, with ASD about some of you know, how do you know how do you go about uh, safe hand washing? What's it going to be like when we go to the grocery store? What's it going to be like when we go back to the dentist? Um, virtual learning resources, support virtual learning, visual supports, uh, as well as uh, various different kinds of coping strategies that we have uh, available for the community. Um, I also uh, want to share uh, just a few other, uh, our colleagues at other um, institutions have also developed some, some great resource guides which we'll share. Uh, Autism Speaks and the Autism Science Foundation have created an alliance now where they are um, working with essentially having uh, institutions across the country send them resources and they're kind of curating them as well. Um, and then our colleagues uh, at Yale and at uh, University of North Carolina also have really excellent research guides. Um, uh, and so, uh, with that, I just want to take a moment to remind you uh, of, of our website, of our Facebook page, our Instagram, our YouTube. And uh, I also think it bears note, you know, much of the work that I've described today um, is funded uh, by generous donation uh, and, and support uh, from, uh, from alumni, uh, from those who've received services here, or those who are simply just dedicated to supporting the autism community here on Long Island. And uh, I think particularly in light of COVID-19, we are you know, even more in need of your support. So um, we do have a support us page on our website, but also I would uh, you know, say if anybody's interested, please feel free to reach out to us directly or to our advancement team, because um, we would, uh, we're, we're really eager to both be able to continue to offer uh, this, this research, uh, re research and programming to you to grow uh, what we're doing and um, to continue to let the initiative uh, be a, a hub and uh, be able to answer that question um, of every child on Long, Long Island with autism. What do they have for me at Stony Brook today? I hope we got something and I hope I've uh, shared something worthwhile with you today. So with that, I want to take a few minutes uh, to answer your questions. So Debbie, I think I'll kick it to you. Awesome, thank you, Matt. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Matt, for that. Um, so before I jump to the questions that I've already uh, collected from everyone, I just wanted to open up that the chat is still open. So if you do have a question, um, please feel free to type it in. The first question um, does come from Jillian. Thank you. Um, she was wondering if you have, we have any plans to create programs to help young adults and um, adults on the spectrum maybe find a job or any other programs for adults. Mm. Ex excellent question. So, um, you know, all this is happening kind of one step at a time, but uh, we have actually focused, uh, employment is one of our, our areas of focus here. Uh, we actually were the lead site of, a, uh, the U of representing the whole United States uh, for an international study looking at the shape of employment and best of employment supports for those with autism, um, which actually became a, uh, a policy uh, brief uh, put out by the International Society for Autism Research. 
Um, so, so that is an area of focus for us. Likewise, Steve Stern here in our economics department, uh, distinguished professor of economics, has um, um, done excellent work uh, understanding sort of what uh, effective employment and uh, uh, means and how we quantify that. Uh, so, you know, what what Jillian is asking is, of course, how do we translate that now into action? And so, um, what I would say is one of our our goals. Um, one of our sort of next step goals uh, as we're sort of building this foundation of services is to provide um, more of, of a resource center that can operate in that way. Uh, we have already helped with the development of evidence-based tools, for instance, to um, support effective employment, uh, both uh, uh, seeking, searching, finding, and maintaining. Uh, and so, you know, we're gonna work to, to be a, a site to deploy those tools. I think the other key, key piece I want to be clear on, both in terms of this and almost all of our programming, is you know, uh, you know, fundamentally we see the research, our research efforts and our service efforts as going hand in hand. And so, as we work to develop those kinds of supports, um, the question is going to be how can we uh, deliver them in a way that is uh, is extremely accessible, and second, how can we deliver them in a way that we can take good data so that. Uh, we can be a force multiplier, not just helping the people who are in the program, but actually say, what can we learn from them uh, to help others in the future? Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Another great question um, came from Stephen, and he uh, loves the programs that we're doing, but he was uh, wondering if there was a way that we planned on using to measure the effectiveness of any of the programs. Mm. Thank you for bringing that up. So, um, almost uh, most of our, well, let me just say, much of our kind of core uh, treatment research the, uh, is all being done under, uh, uh, the things being done within, within our lab anyway, are done under the auspices of treatment research. So what I mean is we're offering intervention programs uh, that are often funded by grants. Uh, for instance, we have a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health for a collaboration uh, called SENSE that we're doing with uh, our colleagues at Vanderbilt University and University of Alabama that's providing uh, 10 weeks of uh, free evidence-based uh, social um, uh, social treatment uh, for teens on the spectrum um, uh, over the course of, of four years. And and so I guess for, for much of what we offer, what I'm saying is uh, the, the approach is we come up with an idea, we seek uh, grant funding to be able to do it as a research study. And then that lets us deliver these things for free and measure the outcomes and then publish on, on those findings. Um, other projects, other things that we're offering, like uh, is some of our, our more community programming, like what Debbie offers, or like the Psychics program, that kind of goes the other way, where we say, well, let's develop something right here, right now, and then see if we can kind of bootstrap um, ways of measuring effectiveness on it. And I'm happy to say that we're doing that. Uh, we have a wonderful team that, that's doing program evaluation on various different uh, programs. Uh, our uh, Jennifer Kalusker, as I mentioned, Dr. Kalusker is doing uh, evaluation of the emergency department pro support program. Uh, our interns seem to be a postdoc, uh, one of our postdocs, um, Cynthia Brown, um, is uh, helping to measure um, uh, what's happening in the Sidekicks program. And uh, we're developing sort of other approaches for uh, for, for measuring other programs as well. So the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, another question that came in from Stephen and another, uh, actually a couple different people is, um, do you have any maybe quick takeaway uh, anxiety coping skills that um, our parents can utilize? For themselves or for their kids? <laughs> For their kids mainly. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's it's reasonable for both. Um, you know, I I think in the uh, the first thing I would say is you know please do visit our uh, our Facebook page where we posted uh, some wonderful webinars uh, on exactly this. Um, but I think I think in brief, uh, leveraging the the leveraging the stability that we can find. I think is one of the, the key messages during COVID, particularly for, for those with ASD. Whether that is, you know, uh, creating some structure uh, for the morning or something to uh, anticipate, or, you know, having a favorite game 
that uh, uh, Sean gets to do each day. Uh, a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the stress that we're seeing, I think, come you know, does does seem to come from um, just how uncertain things feel from day to day. And so, um, finding little anchors of certainty and using those as kind of uh, a tool or something to get back to. Um, and I think importantly, particularly right now, not even necessarily using them as, as a reward, right? Just saying, this is something that, that, that you, we all need to kind of get through the day. Um, that can, can be, a, I think, a really uh, a valuable strategy. I think the other piece is, um, uh, you know, simple, um, simple breathing, uh, breathing techniques or uh, that, uh, again, we can uh, share resources for how to sort of how to access these, um, but uh, sort of taking uh, time and space and sort of using really simple, basic child-focused uh, mindfulness supports um, uh, are often, have been, are appearing to be particularly helpful for this uh, population right now. Uh, again, I think because it's sort of focusing and orienting in an environment that feels so chaotic. Thank you, Matt. Um, a question that's come in a couple of times as well is um, how can providers get involved with what's going on at Stony Brook or get on, figure out what's going on? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, good question. So uh, we have uh, an email address. It's uh, autism underscore initiative at stonybrook.edu. Um, uh, that's available on the website. Also, you could email Debbie uh, directly. Um, but uh, she, really, as our outreach coordinator, um, Debbie, who, again, for those who are unclear, she's the woman with purple hair who's answering your questions right now. Um, uh, uh, that's, that's really central to her, to her role, is to kind of act as a hub uh, and contact. So what we would say is, please, if you are a family, if you're a provider, if you're just you know, interested, uh, please do feel free to reach out. Um, our goal here is to is to support and build the community. And just so everyone knows, I just put that email that uh, Matt said in the chat, so you guys can copy it. Um, Jen, uh, Jenna, I just want to check in with you. Um, how much more time do we have for questions? We have just a couple more minutes left. So if there are a few more questions, let's uh, let's wrap up with maybe maybe one or two more questions. Awesome, okay. So um, Matt, you had um, touched on the, the sensory issues of wearing a mask. There was a question that came in about um, maybe some tips or tricks to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And that's, we, we hear that a lot from families. Um, one thing I would say is that there are um, some companies now that are, are actually trying to develop more sensory friendly masks um, that we're, we're kind of looking into and want to, we'll certainly let people know about them if we find some that seem to work well. Um, but I think, I think in general, uh, just being aware of the, the points of contact, right, that are, that are uncomfortable and finding ways to uh, kind of minimize that. So perhaps using a mask that uh, is not quite as tightly fit. Um, I know that seems counterintuitive, but if the option is between wearing a mask that's too, it's too, too tight that a child might rip off their face versus one that's uh, a little bit more loosely fitting, uh, as well as perhaps, you know, putting in, um, we've heard some folks who are putting in things like, you know, cotton or kind of little, um, kind of like foam uh, kind of barriers uh, near where, where it touches the face. So it's not as abrasive. Um, that's something that uh, has I've been well responded to. And another piece, which I think is uh, per perhaps shouldn't be um, undersold, is um, designs. I know that that's sort of funny. I mean, that's 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 not really the sensory piece, but for for many uh, kids on and off the spectrum, what we're hearing is that you know having a favorite character or even being able to be a favorite character, you know, having Spider-Man's face, you know, be your face, uh, or uh, Pikachu's face be your face uh, often can be motivating enough that it might make the sensory issues at least a little bit less aversive. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Matthew Lerner, thank you so much for just sharing your time with us and all of this wonderful information. 
Debbie, thank you for your time and everything you're doing for the center and for moderating this great discussion. Dean Sampson, we're so honored that you joined us today. Thank you so very much for being here. And thank you, Janet, for organizing all of us and making this such a great event. Thank you. Everyone, on behalf of the Stony Brook Alumni Association, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, at the association, we are so grateful to the College of Arts and Sciences, Sciences and the Autism Initiative for um, spending this time with us this afternoon. We hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, please stay well, stay healthy, stay safe. We have a great program coming up next Thursday. If you'd like to join us again, we have um, Professor Andrew Flesher, and he's going to be talking about ethics, values, and changes within public health during a pandemic. That's next Thursday at two o'clock, so stay tuned for that invitation. We'd love to have you back again. And after today, we will share all of these great resources, uh, the video, and lots of information for you. So we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.